Far East. Good morning from Mexico. We say hi to all of you who will come to this this meeting. We want to reflect on uh, the school aspect of this meeting. Champagnon, his experience in school was very, was quite horrible. He was born in a very violent place. After many years, after 200 years, we are now here together to know what we want our, the marriage school to become. We are here to share also aspects of our charism that we can share with young people and students, children. Here we have four married women, four educators from different parts of the world. They will teach us how to integrate our education practices with the tendencies around the world so that we can truly answer the problems that humanity is facing. How are we going to adapt our marriage, our marriage to values, how they can help us solve the tendencies around the world? How can we make schools become homes of light? How we can inspire students? How schools can be prophetic for the world of today? How can they transform the world? It is a great pleasure to me to welcome Michelle Yordao and Kate from Australia, Emilia from Filipinas, and Bandit from South Africa. So give them a round of applause. These are Marist educators. Hello, good morning, good afternoon Who to who whomever is online. It is a great pleasure for me to be here to represent so many teachers, both men and women, that have great experience and that are doing an amazing job in the marriage world and our schools, of course. My greatest joy is to share not just with my peers, but be being here and sharing all these days, these are days of sharing, of speaking with one another. These are subjects that are very complex. But at the same time, we have a lot of time, a lot of time to reflect on them, a lot of time to share poetry. In, in a way, Mexican culture is like that. It's like poetry. This is such a joyful con a culture in the Mexican culture. This is such a gorgeous country. The food as well. So parents, students that are here with us, welcome. We welcome you with great joy in this moment of spirituality. Yesterday there was a party. And we enjoyed a lot of folk music from Mexico. Like I said, this is all poetry to me. I loved every second of it. I think that we all feel in our body the influence of Mexican culture. So we also did it again with this song dedicated to Marceline. So now I'd like to welcome the other three participants, that is Nomipan, that will be with us here. The idea of this first moment is not to talk about every solution or every single tendency that we can see in the marriage world. Rather, the idea is to inspire one another. Because we are 
that's why we are here with these young people. We are going to share experiences with the different groups. We are going to talk about the tendencies around the world in this space that we can build together. And to gain inspiration. That is why I invite teacher Noemi, who teaches at a college in the Philippines. So welcome. Give her a round of applause. Hey, hello. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Good morning. Olá, Noemi. Você está nos escutando? Hello, Noemi. Uh, can you hear us? Okay, not a problem. No, nos pensamos. We, we thought that she might have uh, had a problem connecting, so she sent us a video. But if we're able to connect with her, then we'll do so. Thank you, Michelle. Mabuhay. Warm greetings from the Philippines. Thank you very much for inviting me to share my experience on restaurants in education. 
in response to the Mars call to be home of light. I will focus my sharing on student engagement, simple strategies that work. The COVID-19 pandemic has wreaked havoc on our lives, and it is difficult to estimate the long-term economic, behavioral, or societal impact as these aspects have not been studied to a great extent. The pandemic has led to dramatic changes on how teachers act and how learners behave. After more than two years of staying at home and using online or blended learning, students now return to face-to-face -face learning in the classroom. In the Philippines, students are gradually adjusting to this mode of instruction and teachers face the challenge of engaging students to learn. What is student engagement? It is when students show up and learn actively, participate in the learning, and demonstrate a positive attitude. Why is there a need for student engagement? Researchers show that engaging students result to high attention and commitment to the task at hand. Engaged students learn better and faster. And what is more important is that engaged students become lifelong learners. It is easy to spot when students are not engaged in the classroom. They appear bored, sleepy, or simply not paying attention at all. So what then is needed? Teachers need to focus on learning rather than teaching. It is not enough to cover the material, but to ensure that students actually learn. There is a need to go beyond recall and give more emphasis to higher order thinking skills. There is also a need to simplify strategies and learning tasks so students can actively participate and relate them to real life experiences. The challenge is, how do we engage our students to learn? I would like to share our experience at Notre Dame of Marvel University Integrated Basic Education Department on engaging students the barest way. Tatak Marista refers to the overall characteristics of being a Marist educator and student. This is the brand of education that is uniquely Marist. One essential value that we focus on is to promote simplicity in the things that we do with emphasis on what is relevant and what is responsive to the signs of the times. I would like to cite examples of our student engagement outside the confines of the classroom. We call them simple strategies because they do not require complex resources or sophisticated technologies. We believe that by presenting our students with activities and learning materials in an easy, digestible, and simple manner, we are making them much more knowledgeable. This approach is experiential. They can then incorporate current lessons with their prior knowledge and be on their way to becoming the more creative and analytical expert learners. One strategy is service learning. Service learning promotes student engagement through hands-on experience and a student-centered approach to community service. Our students participate, for example, in regulatory growing activities solid waste management, and environmental protection com campaigns that are spearheaded by our local government, particularly against mining. NDMU is a green campus. We do not use plastic or styrofoam containers. Soft drinks and junk food are not sold in our canteens. Solid waste are segregated. Teachers and students help in maintaining cleanliness in the campus. In this strategy, students learn concepts of environmental science, and at the same time, they realize that their simple and collective action 
contribute to protecting Mother Earth. Another strategy is inter interdisciplinary teaching that challenges students to make connections between different subjects. They work across different topics with colleagues to create assignments that foster creativity and experimentation while also expanding their own worldview. For example, students are given a new story and a related question or a problem is posed that they need to solve on their own or they may want to join a particular group. Another example is learning through arts. Students are allowed to express themselves throughout work that they commonly put on display. This strategy cuts across learning the languages, sciences, and the humanities. Inquiry-based learning allows our students to focus on open question or problem using evidence-based reasoning, creative problem solving, and adapting to the particular situation. For example, our students are asked how they can survive in a forest with limited resources. They have to find ways how to cook a meal or how to make a shelter using indigenous materials as you can see in the photos. Similar to inquiry-based learning is project-based learning which challenges students to work individually or in groups to address an engaging or intricate question related to their curriculum. Students conduct, for example, uh, science projects and action researches that address existing problems. They present their findings through poster presentations or research forum. This strategy allows students to be creative and innovative in their way of learning and thinking. Then we have practicum or practical work such as cookouts and skills competitions which provide students opportunities to showcase their learning. For instance, during the nutrition month and feast days, students prepare their own food to share. Our school also promotes healthy competition among students through sports, sociocultural activities, and livelihood skills. In addition, they also learn teamwork, the value of diversity, hard work, and persistence. In the photos are students preparing a meal and a student who is competing in a fruit carving contest. In these activities, parents and family members are usually invited. All these strategies allow learners to imbibe a value system that is truly marist, or we call it in the Philippines, tatak marista. After sharing our experience on student engagement, I prepared some questions for reflection and this can be challenges as well to different stakeholders in school. As teachers, how do we create a learning environment that is filled with positivity, encouragement, and excitement for learning? As students, how do we make the most of our experiences in school to make us lifelong learners? As parents, how do we provide support to our children's education so they view learning as fun and at the same time seeing it as relevant for their future and in becoming a productive member of a community? As school heads and leaders, how do we create our schools as home of light, seeing the value of working with and functioning as part of a team? In conclusion, Engagement requires that students know they are important, that their ideas are actually very essential. By using strategies that make students active partners in the learning process, they feel supported and encouraged. There is no telling what the married learners will be able to accomplish, but we can be sure that they have the needed knowledge 
skills, and values that will help transform the community or even the world that we live in. With that, thank you very much. Maraming maraming salamat po. Muchas gracias, Noemi. Thank you for sharing your experiences. We noticed with uh, her talk a very important value, which is the appreciation of diversity. So, innovation is not always synonym with technology. A lot of the time, innovation is bringing our students to a new dimension, a new relationship with nature, a new relationship with their peers and with their communities. So our biggest objective is to promote their thinking and to make sure that everything we do is in favor of our students. What Noemi shared with us is what we already know. Instead of just bringing our students to the classroom to hear us speak, we need to bring them to ask questions and ask even more questions after those. All of these projects that they created we can see it is possible to bring back the desire to learn in our students. And so Noemi shared something very valuable with us. In another talk we had, it was very clear how is Noemi's personality, she said. What characterizes the most is passion and love for teaching and something that she considers very significant for Mars of Marceline is to teach you first need to love your students and I think Noemi really exemplified this ideas with her presentation thank you Noemi for your participation right now I'm going to invite Professor Pam who works in ethics and the pastoral. She works in Johannesburg in South Africa. So Pam, welcome. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you, Dr. Michelle, and thank you so much. Um, buenos dias, everybody, good morning. Um, it's a beautiful evening here in South Africa, and I am so happy to be with you. And um, I feel really privileged to be representing both uh, my Marist province of Southern Africa and my school, Sacred Heart College, Marist Observatory. So thank you. Thank you very much. So I have um, been asked to share with you, with you just some of the ways that we lean into St. Marcelin's dream to create homes of light in our school. The trend that I would like to highlight with uh, you today is that of building community, inclusive, welcoming spaces so that the characteristics of family spirit can be seen, felt, and tasted by those in our schools and beyond. We also know that community is an essential element in creating Maris life. This is true both for, for brothers and for lay Marists alike. As Brother Emily reminds us, essentially, it is about recognizing that community is at the heart of our life. 
and in Water from the Rock, we are reminded that we are called to develop a quality of communion that allows families, religious communities, and other forms of community living to become homes where the young are helped to mature, where we take care of the aging, and are especially kind to the weak. Places where we forgive one another and heal wounds, where we joyfully celebrate the life we share together. What lies behind this call? This call to healing space, to community? Well, it's the sad reality of so much brokenness. And here I share with you an image and some writing from one of our refugee children. I ran, 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 and got me lost. The disparity between rich and poor and the unequal access to education continues to grow. Impossibly large and overcrowded classrooms or no classrooms at all, or even worse yet, no access to education. And in the voices of some of our refugee children again, in my country, we do not have food, we do not have clothes to wear, and no school, no good life. And when I come here in South Africa, they wanted to kill me. We were from the shops then, they saw we were strangers and they wanted to kill us and we ran and ran. But people in my country do not have jobs and people in my country, they are suffering. And as another young student expressed it, everybody thinks that I am clever, but nobody knows how hard it is to study. Everybody thinks that I can play baseball, but they don't know how hard it is to play. Everybody thinks that I can carry my bag, but they don't know how hard it is to carry. Everybody thinks that I can go to the shops, but they don't know how confused I am. I have nothing to say. At Sacred Heart College, we enjoy a long history of working to counter the elitism that often comes with private education. And many of our children are on scholarships. So here you see the three violets, not only a symbol of simplicity, modesty, and humility, but also the symbol for our scholarship fund. What this means is that the school becomes more accessible to children of diverse cultures, of diverse races and economic strata, and it offers a wonderful ex um, ex experience for rich exchanges. And as Pope Francis reminds us, diversity is a richness, never a reason for exclusion. It takes conscious effort to create a space where all are truly welcomed and find belonging. Welcoming and um, respecting diverse faiths is something we have had to learn how to embrace. This too challenges our bias and our prejudice, and we soon realize that those who we thought were other are not a threat, are not that different, not to be feared or mistrusted, but to be admired and embraced. We do not in any way try to dominate or convert each other, but to be curious, interested, and open to what each person brings. And as again Brother Emily reminds us, we must continue then on a daring path, creating spaces of dialogue and encounter that foster mutual growth. Not all families arrive with this capacity or used to this diversity. And so there is a lot of conscious work that needs to be done to create bridges 
to cross the divides that our minds put up. And a lot of time needs to be given to conversations and understanding one another. Another huge challenge that we are called to engage in in our school is the steady stream of refugees seeking asylum in South Africa, fleeing violence, war, and poverty. These families often arrive without any papers, and so they suffer a great identity crisis of invisibility and of namelessness, struggling for access to public health, to employment, and for the children to education. To address this, the 3 to 6 project was born 14 years ago, and it offers primary school children bridging classes in literacy, just basic literacy, numeracy, and life skills. The project also offers a daily meal, helps with documentation and vaccinations, all with the aim so that children are able then to enter mainstream schooling in high school. Initially, the project ran from three until six in the afternoon, and that is where it gets its main Support and holiday programs to keep them off the streets, especially during xenophobic attacks, which arise from time to time. Food security has also been a part of the project, and so the children have learned to plant and grow food, um, and the schools have made available garden spaces. And these have been um, joined by community networks. So not just something that um, the school is constantly doing, but we combine with a whole lot of uh, different organizations in the area um, who have helped support adult literacy for the parents in the, in the project, that have helped with computer skills. Our most recent project, uh, we're going to be teaching people how to make bread so that they can start small businesses and hopefully live lives with a little more hope. Another important part of the project has been the presence of international volunteers through CMI and other um, organizations. Um, but this has greatly enriched the project and has also helped the growth of our Marist youth movement. It gives us the gift of experiencing the global family of experiencing connectedness. COVID unfortunately has um, thrown quite a lot of spanner in the works around this. And so um, our volunteers lately have been local volunteers, but we have continued. Uh, sadly, two international volunteers who have tried to come to South Africa this year have been unable to because of South African bureaucracy post-pandemic, um, but we still are grateful to have been able to continue and create opportunities for participation. So this project is in the throes of some changes. Um, partly it has lost funding post-COVID um, because of cutbacks, also because it has been going for so long. Uh, some of the funders um, are not wanting to extend their funding. And so the project is now becoming um, a full-time primary school, and we will get some support from the South African government for that. The Maris youth community um, will change. It will cease to exist as it has been, um, and we await the spirit to guide us on the next steps of what that will look like. 
funding and vision to support the community, as well as exploring other options for volunteering within the province in other projects also needs to be discerned. Although the difficulties of poverty and the plight of refugees often feel insurmountable at times, it is important that we keep St. Marcelin's dream alive, that we support each other, that we create islands of sanity, as Margaret Wheatley suggests, and as we work hand in hand with other Marists, with other community groups and faith-based organizations, we find family, we see hope in the midst of despair. Our children can experience meaning in emptiness and light in the darkness. And as one of our refugee children told us, here at Sacred Heart is a best experience. I am learning to be happy again, to make friends, and I am also learning a new language, English. So let us ask ourselves, are we willing to use whatever power or influence we have to create islands of san sanity that evoke our best human qualities to create, produce, and persevere? Are we willing to accept unconditionally our brothers and sisters on the margins and create a welcoming family for each one? May Mary continue to inspire us in a new iterations of Living Marcelin's Dream as a true family, as God's family. Thank you. Então, acho que essa alegria... I think that we should not be scared by all the challenges ahead. We invite to stick to our beliefs so that we can truly believe, because we can truly help all those children in situation of borders. People that need our help, not merely economic help. So thank you for letting us remember the importance of education for refugees. Um, tells us that hope does not mean the promise. Hope is more of a road, a lot of time. We have to think in the house, in the common home. Thank you, Pam, for your experience. Pam um, is someone who has a very big passion, passion for art, for nature, for spirituality. And she showed us how all that can create a legacy in the projects that helps the community. Thank you, Pam, again for your participation, for your values, and for keeping the values of St. Marceline alive. Thank you. Now we're going to have another expert who will show us her experience. I'm talking, of course, about uh, Professor Kate. She's going to tell us about her experience. She is a teacher of a school in Australia, and she's going to tell us. She's going to share with us um, the practices that happened there. So. Hello everyone, my name is Kate Fogarty, I'm the principal at Assumption College in Kilmore. So sorry not to be there with you in Mexico, 
Um, we're coming up very close to the end of the school year here in Australia, just a couple more days before the students go to their Christmas break and their long summer break. So I'm sure you can understand why it's important that I'm here at the school, but I would love to be there with you and be involved in the amazing conversations and ideas generation that's happening um, amongst you at the moment. So I was going to talk to you today about this value that we have as Marists about our passion for our work and how we love our work and how maybe we can rethink about how that impacts what we do with our students. So we know that the international data coming out of PISA and a number of other international bodies is showing that our students, particularly our adolescents, our teenagers, are showing a declining engagement with their learning. And that's coming through in a whole range of, of ways, but they're stagnating in their growth and in some cases even going backwards. And we know uh, that fewer students are reporting that they are feeling engaged with their work and feeling like their schoolwork is relevant to the future that they think is in front of them. Every single one of us, I'm sure, can tell stories about how our young people are being influenced more and more by the devices that they have in their hands and the influencers who can contact them and provide them with ways of thinking and ways of being and ideas um, at the touch of a button through all of the many social media channels that our young people are engaged with at the moment. And while some of that is very positive for their learning, there are other ways that that is impacting learning in really significant ways and in ways that challenge us to think about education in, in a fresh way, in a new way. And I guess the other thing that's going on, particularly in a, a world that is recovering from the pandemic, is that we're coming to understand more and more that there's no one pathway for any of us. That as our students graduate from our schools, it's likely that they will have many jobs across their career and even many careers across their lifetime, whole different areas of work that they're engaging with and different types of work and, and many forms of work that we have never considered before and that we just have no understanding of in terms of helping them to prepare for that future. So we've been thinking about that for a while here at our school. And I think one of the things that's really challenged us over the last five or six years is the work of the economist Daniel Pink, who I'm sure a number of you are familiar with. He has several books in the marketplace that are hugely, wildly popular around the world for his thinking and his research on why we do what we do and how we do what we do. We were very influenced by his book Drive, which came out in 2009, which is particularly around what motivates us. So what motivates everyone around the world? What are the key things that we know drive us to learn and drive us to try new things? And we took his learning and tried to think about our school in terms of the principles that he said made the biggest difference to engagement with learning. And it's basically these three things you can see on the screen. Firstly, mastery. That we don't actually like just learning at a surface level that we all have passions and we all have things that really motivate us in our life, that we seek to go deeper in our learning. And our young people are just the same. And if we could help find those hooks and those opportunity for mastery where students could go deep in things they were passionate about, then we could use the motivation from that to spur them into learning in other areas that they might not find so exciting and, and driving for them. The second is autonomy. We all know that, you know, when we have choice in what we're learning, we are much more motivated to be involved. And we know that not every student gets as excited about humanities as they do about science. And not every student is as passionate about language as they are about mathematics. And if we could find ways to give students autonomy, Bearing in mind that every single one of us has some constraints in our schools around what our government expects of us, the kind of student learning that's expected of us, 
and maybe even the kinds of results that are expected of our school. Even given those things, we can all be thinking more about how can we give our students autonomy and not just in the kind of um, tasks they're doing or assessments they're undertaking, but really what subjects are they choosing? What do they absolutely have to do? And where can they have as much choice as possible, as much autonomy in their learning as possible? So Dan Pink says those are two things that will make a big difference in motivation. The third thing that really has a huge impact on our motivation is when we can see a purpose to our learning. And we all know this. Every time we go to a conference or a workshop or a meeting where there's not a clear purpose and where we can't see it changing our behaviours or our understanding or our future, we just check out. We don't pay attention. And we see that more and more with our students, don't we? That their sense of what is relevant to the future is shifting very dramatically and what they see the future being and their workplace being and their career being um, is often very, they, they can't see a through line from the subject they're studying now to that work they believe they'll be doing. So we have to think more cleverly about what is the purpose of the learning for our students and do they have to all do year nine history? Do they really all have to do um, a physics element of their science or are there other ways that we can still meet the requirements that are expected of us and allow our students to really go deep into the subjects where they see a strong purpose for their future? Can, um, we, were, we were just really curious, can we authentically respond to those three things and build our school differently? And the answer for us was yes. And I guess the challenge we want to put in front of everyone today is to think about not just at the school you're at, but perhaps in the area, the country, whatever it might be that you're in. How can we foster together opportunities for schools to provide mastery, autonomy and purpose for our students, especially when we know we can connect so much more easily via all of the tools that we learned to use during the pandemic. So we have a school of 1,400 students. Uh, they're a very middle class group of students. Some of them come from farms. Some of them, a lot of them live in towns. They come on a, you know, a, over an hour on the bus to us every day and some from just across the road. We're a very homogenous um, community in, or a very, a very balanced community, if you like. We have some very wealthy families. We have some families who really are very, very poor and we have everything in between. So we really got to try this with a very um, diverse group of students. And the way that we were able to provide mastery, autonomy and purpose for every single student and provide every single one of them with an individual pathway where no two students have the same subject, not any two across all of those 1,400 students, was we broke the school vertically. So instead of having year seven, we're a secondary school, year seven, year eight, year nine, year 10, year 11, year 12, from age 13 through to 18, um, we were able to design our classes and design our curriculum based on the stage of learning that the students are at. So some of you would have heard of stage, not age, learning. So there's no such thing as year nine students and no such thing as year 10 students. Our classes are all vertical. So when our teachers go in to teach their very specialised subjects, they could be teaching a 13-year-old, a 14-year-old and some 17-year-olds in their class, so all vertically organised classes. And how we did that was we provided our students with all of their data in a very authentic way. They know their external testing data, they know the results they're getting on all of their assessments. They can compare and contrast themselves with others. They can use their passion and their engagement and the things that they have interest in to build a curriculum with their parents and with our staff that works for them as individuals. So they choose their subjects individually right from 12 and 13 years old. They know their own data. They can make sure that if they have a weakness, for instance, if they're not very strong at maths, they might hold themselves at a lower level than what we would have pushed them through if they were with their big year level and do maybe two subjects, two maths or even three maths. But they might be very, very strong at English and can push themselves up in their English subject. 
So we really were able to cater by organising the classes that way for all of those individual differences that young people have between them. And it created a huge array of choice for our students. So we are a very mainstream school, but we recognise that our students needed more. We needed to respond differently if we were going to break through that lack of engagement, that malaise, that stopping point that happens around those teenage years. So we use mastery, autonomy and purpose to rebuild the timetable to create entirely new subjects. So, for instance, in um, science, instead of having Year 7 science, Year 8 science, Year 9, Year 10, we now have 23 science subjects that go for a semester that our students can choose across five different levels of learning. So lots of opportunity for our students to get very specific about what motivates them and the level of learning that they need for the skills and the learning and the moment in time that they are in. Um, and what happened? Well, we're three years in, very exciting. Even during COVID and the lockdowns, we ploughed ahead. Our student engagement has increased across all of our measures. We do lots of testing and um, get lots of data around that. Their, their actual test results are up in their classes, which is just so exciting for us all. The students are reporting to us that they feel more valued and understood as individual learners rather than as part of a big group or a big class. Um, our teachers love teaching their specialised subjects. We're having lots of applications to come and work with us at the school because people can teach very particular areas and really bring growth and, um, and excitement to the learning of students. And our parents and our friends of the school just keep talking about us out in the community. And you can check out on our school website, there's lots of videos there about the program and how it all fits together and how we help our students to make all of those choices. So research tells us that if we're going to keep building the engagement of our learners and help them to grow into the best version of themselves and into great Marists, we need to improve in our schools opportunities for mastery, autonomy and purpose. So my question to you is how can we continue to build together with all of the great resources and all of the great knowledge that we have more opportunities for our students to go deep in their learning, to mastery, to have more choice, so to open up to other areas in, in what they could be learning at their schools and to feel like their learning is purposeful. And I can't wait to hear how it all goes there in Mexico and to just see this idea of Champagne Global grow and grow and grow. So best of luck to you all. I hope it's you know a wonderful opportunity for you but that your learnings and your conversations come back to all of us out in the schools in ways that really help us to engage our learners and create the best book schools possible. Thanks everyone, see you later. Professor Kate. She brings uh, another dimension that's very important for us, the participation. When we are talking about participation of our students, we talk about the four pillars of education, which is learning to learn, autonomy, that love for learning, to learn how to collaborate, and we invite the community, the parents, to give them protagonism as well. Learn and learn how to act through projects, through participation that usually have a place in their context. Sometimes in education, we fall into the excess. And what this professor invited us is to choose, to choose what's essential and to un really understand what's the content of the materials we're teaching our students. This is very significant, especially when we think about the pandemic. In Brazil, we haven't talked a lot about bringing back uh, learnings because how can we bring back something that we never had in the first place? 
how can we prioritize information for students in this sense i think this was a very good invitation for the reflection on the future we want for our students a future filled with autonomy and with positive projects uh, for the future of our students so thank you professor once again for your experience in now beto We want to thank our teachers, Kate from Australia, Pam de Sudaf from South Africa, Noemi. All of them are connected with us, so maybe if you have a question later, you can ask. But I'd also want to invite Michelle Stesa. She was a Mari student. She's been teaching for 12 years. She's now helping with teachers formation in Brazil, we want to hear your thoughts as well about the trends in Mars education and your best practices. So please, an applause for Michelle. Thank you. Please, Ricardo, help me. And now we are going to continue with this talk about Mari schools as lighthouses. These lighthouses that think about this common home, this house that we cannot leave behind and we cannot leave the, the tendencies again. I chose some of the tendencies that we've already seen to say that tendencies in their study is very important. We need to really analyze them, but the tendencies don't always apply in every context. We sometimes don't have the possibility to adopt each of them. So now we need to think mostly about the human benefit we'll get. So here we have three significant elements. First, integral ecology. Uh, we're talking and using, which is the respect of interconnection of every ecology. This integration and this connection, it's a part of a network. We cannot talk about ecology only um, in theory. That participates only with the connective area of our societies. We need to have an ecology for the for politics, for our culture, for our technologies, but it always need to work together to promote the protagonism of our students. In that sense, we cannot forget ethical ecology which is the ecology in which we are always against injustice, inequality, and exclusion. We've included this vision of, eco of integral ecology that unites us within a network. If we can see the dimension of interconnection widening which can be a huge challenge for a lot of us because at the same time when we are hyper connected sometimes we are not available to meet with other humans we're not available for one another we don't really listen to one another. So we are not taking advantage of the relationships among each other and with nature as well. Another huge challenge we have right here is that the dialogue spaces for this interconnection are spaces where 
we don't go. Spaces we don't visit usually. So we forget as well the possibilities like Nata Natalino mentioned yesterday for us. And the problem right now is not on technologies, but in a relationship with technologies. Understanding that these technologies is, are an opportunity to work in a hybrid way, but if we don't have a pedagogical revolution, this is not going to be successful. In our classrooms, we promote this revolution and we promote this evolution. And in the same context, I include this social and emotional dimension where people care for emotional health, not only adults or kids or adolescents we are in a context where people get to the lowest point of suicide and in those in that context we have or marriage context which provide us a lot of opportunities to consider the different dimensions of a person. These dimensions include the person, their emotions, their feelings. So we've already worked in amplifying some projects, but we need to make an emphasis on inclusion of all of the human dimensions. As Maris, we take into consideration all of these aspects in our different classes. Right here, we have high school, the last stage of basic education. Right now, we're having a huge change. This change began in 2018. We made a huge survey with other provinces. We launched this, product, uh, this project with the participation of students, teachers, and we wrote a book where professors, investigators got together to analyze our different practice not only of education but also evangelization spirituality and to talk of what we want for the protagonism of our students and we design a notebook for high school and this brought a lot of benefit for our students we divided the essential learnings that we need to have at school. And the other part of the classes, we decided to work with flexibility in which students can choose those knowledge areas that they want to get deep in. And we gave them the opportunity to create their own projects so that they can give solutions to their local problems. This promotes free, um, free, a more freely environment for students. And here we have the different educational access of the Maris world. And in the next year, in 2023, we are going to have a new Marist educational system, which is new materials, not only books, but a group of new solutions.
And the solution, this that is common for the students and the students that are part of the society. Well, we allow them to have a space and to have it in context. What are we going to do to give protagonism to these young people? We must have a teacher that is a new kind of teacher. Today's years. We have to think on the training of the of the professors. We must have a space for the global network and to consider good practices. If the teacher learns with another teacher. We all learn from one another. It doesn't matter where we are, in which country we are. And we have to, come to take into consideration our identity, our territory. Each professor has their own challenges. But the good thing is that we humans can learn. That is what we do constantly. And in the case of Brazil, we have two main challenges. We have professors for different for some areas of knowledge. Now we have to focus on professors that teach face to face and also that teach online. <laughs> These are resources that are of very good quality. Because that professor that's getting training in, in elementary school must know what are the challenges for basic education. And that's a great challenge in the lack of professors. The ones that are coming are giving less, are giving fewer academic results. So the global network should think of these training processes, especially in that field, because people must know that this has an effect on the future. We have to train the professors. We have to keep this training uh, constant. Sometimes we must, uh, we must, however, give a step backwards and see how we are doing. Because sometimes our professors are not really prepared. No innovation. Innovation is not really necessarily something new, but a culture of sense of experience. We should translate all this to the context of the classroom of the school so that we can have a positive impact. We must and remember our condition of humans. We must have a more human approach, and I'm talking also about the professor and the students. We must take into consideration experiences that are very important in this formative process. And we must ask these questions to our professors so that people can get this, this formation process basing on their experience and something that makes sense to those professors. In Brazil, Marist have worked about, have been working with innovation. There are good experiences that come from training professors, professors that have already have already had certain training, then they can teach other professors. And in that sense, there is not an internal dimension, because when we talk about formation or training, we need our own spaces.
So that that space is not just a, a space of innovation or training, but that people can get inspired and search and put in practice those good practices in the classroom. Now, we cannot really, we have to do more. We must take into consideration other areas, other networks, and business, entre entrepreneurship, all these that it can help to the training of the professor. And we can go forward on what we are living. And in that process, I believe that people can people have to think on on the future and a future that is uncertain. People need to start building. People need to to think on the professor that has integrated into things that are interesting for them. Do we really want a future of exclusion? And not just for the Marist world, but also students that are not part of our Marist worlds. I believe that we need to create a um, world of solidarity, a world for everyone, where we can chase our dreams. And this is what education should give us, more dreams, more projects. Otherwise, we're just wasting our dreams. We need, to, we need also to focus in emotions in sustainability because people, people need this, especially the emotion, to be interested in learning. We professors and the students also need to be interested too in what we learn and teach. In the Marist, in Marist Brazil, we have projects of volunteers that are linked to areas of knowledge. We work with different Christian colleges, and this creates a possibility for the curriculum to have the possibility to allow the children to work in different community associations, in languages, and other areas that we have in our schools. We have a great event that happens in Brazil, which is an event of robotics. This year we have 131 teams of different countries of different states. And we talked about basic science in our context, in our day-to-day -day context. There was some experiences of a, a school that also held in their own community since they taught them about purification of water. And we also, um, we, they also helped with their crops. Also ways in, also ways that people could be less wasteful. Now in Brazil, this was a great sensation. Now the professor could have used this to create a process of alphabetization. He used it to teach mathematics and people to read. Now, this is thanks to the experience that was done in a pedagogic way. We also had other possibilities like a um, bilingual project. This is a project of international internationalization. They didn't teach the English language, they taught in the English language. This helps with inclusion. Please change the slide. 
hackathon. Here we have a school of Centro Sur. And these are all students of first grade. They all participated in that contest and helped through the methodologies. To talk, I'm um, talking about the students, they talk about mental health. And they talked about it with their professors and with their classmates, and they reached different dimensions because they all had different experiences. They talked about um, working in spirituality, emotionally, and physically. So that was all on my part. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Michelle, and all those marriage educators. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. It's already 10.30 here in Mexico, so if we, if we could have Pam and Noemi, they are already connected with us. So here we have a small question, and then do you remember that they are here, not from South Africa and the Philippines, and Michelle is here, if we have any question. Please. I would like to question, I have to ask the question to Pang. If it's, is it Pang? I think so. Oh, sorry. So I think I got it wrong, sorry. Well, I would like to know uh, how is that program to how is that program about voluntariat in your local in your region because i'm asking this as a mother because we haven't heard a lot about the necessities in such remote places for us I would like to know what the process is, the process for ask for this help. And why doesn't it reach to the parents? And what could we do? Right, Pam, did you get that? Pam, did you get the question? The translation is um, it's coming and going, so I'm sorry, I'll have to hear the question again. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Hi, hello. Pam, can you hear me? Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Pam in South Africa, can you hear me? Hi. Hello. Hi, this is a test for um, the English channel. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? De todos modos, vamos a dejar la pregunta un poquito abierta, ¿vale? Por dos, por dos. So it's very interesting what Pam was talking about, and she was talking about a voluntary program that works from 3 to 6 p.m. We have a school with you know, a lot of resources that has a project of solidarity. 
Marcus said maybe you could tell us about that relationship between a college that has a very good socioeconomic place and the volunteer that we have. But it's very interesting to see that that information uh, is reaching us. How could we? How could I be a volunteer without having to go to South Africa? Maybe online. It raises so many questions. So we have to start connecting. That it's important to remember it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship um, and not to see it as um, because people who, people who have money given to, to people who are on the margins. It really, is, it really is about us learning from each other and um, sharing resources and um, yeah so that's that's part of how of how we do it our students in the main school um have projects where they need to interact with the other students so that we are building relationships across that um, divide and in that process the enrichment for both um both schools is it's really amazing I'm not sure if I've answered the question because it's a little bit difficult to hear. Yeah, okay, no, thanks. It's okay, it's okay. Okay, muy bien. Alguna otra pregunta? Any other question that you may have? Any comment? So we wanted to find all these tendencies and we're going to continue with this in the second and third session. So these words from our educators are very enlightening. We wanted to give this first step so that we could talk more in these next sessions. I would like to invite the aunt provincial brother of uh, of West Mexico, Brother Luis, to thank also Michelle and Pam and Noemi and Kate for participating in this meeting. So, Michelle here, that is here, and Brother Luis, uh, I would like to thank you. Michelle, I'm going to talk in Spanish. First, I'd like to thank you a lot for this experience that you have shared with us. But the work that you are doing in Brazil, for, um, for sharing your experience uh, here with us. So we would like to give you a small present in the name of the Institute. I will tell you that we are very happy to have you here. Thank you. Bueno, para... And so for Pam and Noemi, for the camera, uh, here it is, Pam and me and Kate, we will make this get you. And thank you for participating. We value a lot what you are doing and what you're sharing with us. Thank you very much. Okay. So we are uh, we are um, fighting with time. So um, now we are going to um, the session that we're having uh, online. I would like to thank the brothers, the Maris brothers that are here with us. So thank you very much for participating.